volunteer network. Um, probably people have never heard of us. We're in Silver Street, just up by the Abbey. Uh, and we've been here about 20 years. Um, the reason why most people don't know about us is we tend to work with 16 to 25 year olds. So we tend to work with young people and their involvement in the community and volunteering and youth action and lots of things like that. Um, but alongside that, we work with everybody else. They're just not our target audience. So if other people want to do stuff, we'll do that with them as well. Um, the Growing Happiness Project, which is one we're talk, which is coming up, which is the stuff on the screen behind me, comes out of a bit of research that we did at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, which was we were all coming out of COVID and lockdown and all that sort of stuff. And as a charity, we went, who are we? What are we? How, how are we helping people? What should we be doing? And all those sorts of questions. So we could sit around the table and do that, but more importantly, we had to go and ask people. So we went and asked about 300 individuals, uh, what did they want from us? And what did they want moving forward in the world, you know, post COVID? Uh, and a couple of things came from it. I mean, there was the, we want, we want a multiplex cinema and, and a, you know, an Olympic swimming pool. And, yeah, yeah, fine. But there was some stuff in there that came up which was about feeling lost. There was some stuff about feeling isolated. There was some stuff about feeling disempowered. And there was some stuff about wanting to know how and having the opportunities to eat better and to grow food. And we had these thoughts going around in our head in January. And then Sue, who's sitting over there, um, her friend who works at the Abbey, uh, is one of the managers, and she happened to mention to this person at the Abbey, we've got this, we're trying to work this one out. And in a random conversation over lunch, the Abbey said, but we've got these old allotments that no one uses, and if we let you use our allotments, could you do something with it? And we all went, yeah, of course we can. Um, and hence, we've taken over running these allotments. Um, they were part of the original um, uh, space for growing food for the house. Um, half of it's been turned into the car park in Silver Street, but this is the remaining half of it. Um, and, and they've just sat not doing a lot for a few years. So we are, we are now three and a half months into this. <laughs> we are brand new. We have literally just started. Um, we run on a Tuesday and a Wednesday at the moment. And um, the idea is to have different sessions for different people. So at the moment we've got a couple of open door sessions so anybody can come. And I've been trying to explain this in a very professional way to lots of people. And reality is, it's grow stuff, talk shit, feel better. And that's the essence of what we're doing. So people come, they all grow some stuff or they'll just sit and drink tea um, and go away at the end of the session feeling a bit better about life. Um, and on top of that, we're also doing sessions around specific need. So as of the mid middle of August or end of August, we are going to be running sessions for women either pre, during or post menopause. So there are going to be sessions run by women for women. It's going to run, I think, on a Monday afternoon and a Wednesday lunchtime. And it's more about women talking to women about how you cope with this thing. We're, we're going to have people come in and do some technical input. So we're talking to one of the local GPs and she's going to come and talk about drugs. Someone else is going to come and talk about alternatives. Someone's going to talk about healthy eating. So, but the idea of the thing is for women to talk to women and uh, in the garden and, and maybe do a bit of gardening, but maybe not. Um, we, one of the things we said this morning is about teaching people how to grow stuff. Um, actually, we have a bid in at the moment for the Community Foundation, which touch fate walk that we will find out in the next week or two. But if they give us the money, the idea is in September for six months, we're going to start running little sessions for anybody in the local community who wants to come and learn how to grow food, but then how to cook the food. Because one of the things we've found so far is people are very disconnected between a potato and a potato. As in the potato that you buy from the supermarket comes wrapped in plastic and they know what to do with it. But the potato in the ground or the potato that's covered in mud, they're scared of and don't know how to touch it. So the idea is to do bits with them, put stuff in pots that they then take home and carry on growing on their windowsill, in their back garden, wherever. But then also teach them, what do you do with it when it's ready? 
Um, the guy this morning that was talking about growing stuff from the offcuts of the iron like uh, we're, we're going to add that in. Um, the project is there, and the, 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 the simple thing to right now is we're trying to work out what it is. Yeah, we've got these sessions, we've got this space, and we've got the things that people told us they wanted, but they may not be necessarily what they're willing to do. So right now we are doing lots of different things on, on the different days in that suck it and see process to see what people actually want to do. Right? We have groups of young people who want to come and do stuff and are doing stuff, and that's brilliant. Yeah, We've got a general sort of group of people that come, and we're calling them the noisy group at the moment, because they're talking to each other, it's somewhat epic. Right? We've also had to put on another sort of session for people who don't want to talk to anybody else. The quiet ones, so we have this noisy session and we have a quiet session. Um, and people come and do those different bits. Um, Long term future of this is we have enough funding to run this until the end of next summer. Right? The hope is during this year and next year we can prove to funders that this thing is worthwhile. Um, about 15 years ago, we ran a project actually on the, on the bypass here, targeting young people that had mental uh, that have, um, health conditions. So we had a lad who was on his third liver transplant, and we had young people that were struggling with mental health. And it was just this, come, grow stuff, chat to others, you know, feel better. And at the end of sort of six months on that, their use of GPs had gone down by a third. Their use of prescription drugs had gone down by 25%. Their, their use of non-prescription drugs had also gone down. But the only thing we did with them was grow stuff, chat rubbish, feel better. So this is what we're hoping to do here. Yeah. Um, if anyone wants to come and visit us, please come and visit us. We're trying to get our head around this, and part of what we need to do is open the doors and say, come find us. All right? We are in Silver Street, we're at number nine. Um, we don't have a proper door at the moment, so what you do is you ring the doorbell on number nine, and someone looks over the fence and goes, can I help you? And then they go and let you in. So, that's us. That's, that's everything. Unfortunately, she can't be here today because she's got some ongoing health conditions. So instead, it's myself, Miranda, and one of the trustees, and my fellow trustee, uh, Mary, who's also joined us today. Um, so we are a small local charity. Um, who are we and what are we doing? We have been established to, um, to tackle two issues, so to alleviate food poverty uh, within Glastonbury, but also to reduce um, the environmental impact of food waste. Um, as we know, there's lots of waste that is produced by um, supermarkets that could otherwise be redistributed to people in need. Uh, the Grocer uh, magazine in 2022 said that there's going to be an estimated 100,000 tonnes of food which is going to be going to landfill, which could fe feed globally, if we look globally, that was only the UK, uh, it could feed 30 million people. So this is a massive issue. Um, so we run three initiatives. There's the community fridge, which you might have noticed at the front of the town hall here. Uh, so it used to be an elevator shaft, um, and the town council have uh, donated the space to us for free, and we have our community fridge in there. Um, so that is, managed and run by a team of dedicated volunteers. There's 45 volunteers. Uh, we have one member of staff who's part-time, who is our volunteer coordinator. Uh, we have around 20 collections a week from local supermarkets. So that's supermarkets from Street, Wells, Glastonbury and Shepton Mallet. Um, they donate their food to us. We go collect it and put it into the fridge. Um, we also have a community pantry. So that's stocked with food um, that's kind of end of line, they produce too much, um, or it's got a, a kind of a short use by date, but that's uh, ambient food, so food that's got a, a longer shelf life. So think tins, dried pastas, things like that. Uh, that's open twice a week, and it's at the top of Glastonbury High Street in the music shop. Um, in the winter 
wintertime, in the autumn winter, we also do um, free hot food, and that's usually on a Saturday at the top of the high street again. Um, we're not doing it over the summer months, but in the winter we will hopefully start that back up again. And that's just using produce that's either come from the fridge or the pantry. Uh, volunteers cook it up and then distribute it for free. So why are we doing this? Um, as we've already established, as we already know, there's a massive issue of food wastage in this country, but actually around the world in supermarkets overproducing food. Um, Central Glastonbury is among the 10% most nationally deprived areas in the UK. And we don't think of it in that way because we have a fantastic and vibrant community here. But if you look at levels of education, levels of income, um, levels of um, reliance on welfare benefits, Central Glastonbury as a ward is actually in the 10% most deprived areas in the country. Um, a Food Foundation affordability report um, in 2018 highlighted that 3.7 million children in the UK, their families are unable to afford a healthy and balanced diet. And that if you um, go by the um, Eat Well guide, 42% of disposable income for those families would have to go on buying food if they were to have a healthy and balanced diet. Um, Again, as we all know, prices are going up significantly for food products, especially dairy products, oils, things like that. But we all will have seen this in our, in our weekly shops. Prices are going up and they're going to go up again considerably as time goes on. So we're already seeing a massive rise in the amount of people who are accessing the services that we offer. Um, it's individuals, it's families, um, it's people who have never used a food bank or any kind of free food provision before, but they're having to make decisions about whether to fix the car this month so that they can get to work, or whether to, to buy food to be able to eat. So we are seeing an you know, increased demand, and we think this will continue uh, going forward. So some of our achievements so far. Um, we started in, I think it was July 2020? And we became a registered charity um, in December 2021. Uh, and in that time, we have diverted 75 tonnes of food that would otherwise go to uh, landfill through the community fridge. So that's just picking up the excess from local supermarkets. And instead, that's been diverted to people who can, can eat it. Um, if we haven't been able to use it, sometimes we get an overproduction of bread. That's gone to... Um, people's compost bins rather than going to landfill. Uh, but we would say, you know, 95% of it has actually been eaten by people. Um, the community pantry, so that's the, uh, the food with a longer shelf life, has diverted 35 tonnes of food that, again, would otherwise be wasted in the system. Um, and we also do kind of deliveries for local families. So we've, did, we've given over 250 deliveries to date. So that's for people who aren't able to come physically to access uh, the pantry uh, for whatever reason. Either they might be working, they have kind of uh, mobility issues. That sort of thing. Um, we've also given away 2,900 approximately free hot meals and uh, drinks. So in total, uh, that's enough to feed a family of four for around 47 years. So this is food that would otherwise be going to waste, um, being redirected. And we, the hope is that uh, you know, every local town, every local village will have something like a community fridge, a community pantry, to make sure that this food is getting to people who need it. Uh, that is the end of the talk, but any questions? <laughs>
So yes, we, we also accept donations from members of the public. Sometimes we find that money's been left in the pantry by people who have just walked past, thought it's a great idea, and left, you know, left some money in there. Um, so part of our volunteers are the fridge guardians who come in and clean every day. So quite often we get a message in our WhatsApp group to say, someone's left, you know, 10 pounds, can we put it in the bank account, please? Um, we also have a, a few local businesses who give a, a small donation um, every month. Um, the community pantry has a, it's run on a donations basis, uh, so people can have up to 10 items. If they, ha if they can afford it, we say you can pay £2.50 or whatever you can afford. If you can't, then it's free. So we have various ways of funding. Um, yes, we are reliant on funding, but you know, it's, our overheads are very small, so it's, it's easily manageable. So hello everybody, thank you for having me here to speak today. I'm going to talk about some scary sounding things and then some deeply optimistic and useful sounding things what we can actually do in our lives. So I work for an organisation called Eat for Health UK and this is the whole point that in around 2013 the government, the UK government was like, oh people, um, people appear to be um, living for the last 10 to 20 years of their life in really poor health. So it is perfectly viable for a human being to live into the 80s and 90s in good health, good mental faculty, if a person has a lifestyle that supports it throughout their life. So now we're seeing 10 to 20 years in poor health. The government was like, that's a, that's a bad thing. That's not what we want here. Obviously, they've got lots of NHS bills to do with all that kind of stuff. And it has a massive ripple effect on the economy. I'm less interested in that. I'm interested in people's well-being and how able they are in their life and the freedom that they can have to do the things they want to do. So they did this piece of research and they published the Living Well for Longer document. Those titles often give you a little insight into what's actually going on. And they came up with this list of 20 leading risk factors that contribute to what we call premature death, disease, and mortality. So what, what is causing the problems in the human body? And of those 20 leading risk factors, 13 of them were entirely to do with diet. Either what we eat too much of, or what we eat too little of. And I read that and I was like, well this is great, this is very useful. Because if we can eat more of those things, and less of those things, then we can actually regain the empowerment and the relationship with our body that makes us feel really good, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, because of those, the breeze, oh, for the camera, for the camera. <laughs> so the wonderful thing about that document for me was that it gives us this ability to communicate with people because that's what we're really missing. We're missing this understanding of what food means, what health means. Because when someone says, oh, you're healthy eating, so I really should eat salad. Or, you know, it's become very dull, very like should, 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 should. And that does not make us feel good. And I hate being told what I should do. Because if I should be doing it, then I would be doing it. And if it's something I should do that's really good and I could do it, then I would do it. So if a person is not doing it, there is something getting in the way. So, life expectancy sounds like, oh, blah, 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 but it's how long do we get on this planet to be us, to live our lives, to have our children, to have grandchildren, to have, you know, all the things we plan to do when we retire, the things we keep putting off, you know, if we get into retirement and our body doesn't work properly anymore, that's not a good thing. So, I set up the organisation based on those principles about six years ago and, and I've run a lot of different things in the community. But what I want to talk about now is how this impacts children's health more than anything else. So when we look at those 13 risk factors, you could be like, oh yeah, well people should just eat more of that and eat less of that. But food is not that simple. We actually don't make our decisions on food based on the nutritional value. That would be great. But we don't. You know, we're interested in flavours and textures and how convenient it is and how cheap it is and how easily we can get it into the children and what they've got to eat it and all this kind of stuff. So there's a huge amount of factors that contribute to how we choose what we're eating. So this idea of, oh, this is very good and this is very bad, is not useful. We need empowerment and we need informed choice. So this is what I do. I work with families and with children and I teach them, hey, when you eat that, something happens in your stomach, in your gut, in your blood, in your brain. And that will contribute not only to how well you feel in terms of, you know, 
our energy levels, our ability to be free from disease, but it's also our mental health. Like our brain is quite literally made of things called polyphenols that are only in certain fruits and vegetables. And if you don't eat them, your brain doesn't make itself very well and your brain starts getting damaged over time. If I was to get a hundred children on the stage right now, all very cute and nice, from Somerset, then it's very likely, say they were of like reception age children, so four or five years old, it's incredibly likely that around 20 of them would be overweight or obese. And if we were to get a group of 100 children here who were in a, like leaving primary school, like maybe 10, 11 years old, it's likely that nearly 30 of them would be overweight or obese. And now that word overweight or obese is one of those things, it's like, oh, that's, that's definitely a bad thing. But what does that actually mean? So the human body, as you have one now, you probably know, it's got lots of things it needs, like our organs and our blood, and it stores fat on it in order to insulate us, to give us energy, to create our brain, lots of very important things. Now when we're talking about additional weight that is stored on the body, what that actually is, is when we put something in that the body doesn't know how to use, or isn't able to use, or isn't able to get rid of, it ends up converting it into forms of fat that end up stored around our organs and on our body and they ultimately stop our body working properly. So a lot of us are like, you know, health and beauty magazines, it's all like, oh, you've got to get your bleach body, and we've got to think, because it's cool. And it's like, no, it's like, the body can't work. The body cannot continue to function when it is in that state. So when we see that the obesity rate in children is rising, and we're starting to see children getting things like type 2 diabetes, which is a purely lifestyle disease, this is a big deal, because it means that there's a the potential chance of them and their life expectancy, if someone is overweight or obese as an adult, in their adult years, they're about 10 years off their life. And then that's all also the poor health at the end of their life on top of that. And then if you take, for example, that children now are overweight or obese from age four, their life expectancy is going to be hugely reduced. Their quality of life is going to be hugely reduced. So this isn't just that, oh, we really should be like, oh, eating healthy and things, and wouldn't it be great if kids ate their creams? This is what is going to happen to our future as a community if we are that sick and unwell in our body. And an incredible piece of research was done on life satisfaction in the UK, and they studied over 80,000 people to find out what were the factors that added to people feeling really good in their life. They had controlled this study for income, they controlled it for looking at people's health, they controlled it for lots of things. And the number one factor in life satisfaction was how much fruits and vegetables a person ate. If you eat lots of fruits and vegetables today, you will feel better today and you will feel better tomorrow. It's the greatest predictor of how you will feel when you wake up in the morning. So we need to rethink this whole like, oh, healthy eating, and eat well played, and da because that's dull and it's boring and it's full of should, should, should. And actually, we need to start looking at the big picture here. And a lot of people today mentioned in some of the chats we've been having in the room, is about supermarkets. I invite everybody here, and if you're watching on the internet, you do, to go into a supermarket, like, okay, eat something before you go, have a snack in your bag, make an art of it, and then go into the supermarket as if you're going to some kind of museum, and just look at everything. Look at all the posters, look at the advertising, look at where they put things. If you think children's health, walk down like the sweets aisle and that kind of stuff. They put it all at eye height of the younger people, so it's directly where they can see it. And they make it as fun as possible. Because we buy things based on our values, we buy things based on things we care about. So I have a long history of a lot of disordered eating, and at some point in the past when I was learning to drive, which is at some point, I found driving very stressful. So I'd go and fill up the car with petrol, you know, and I'd go in and there'd always be a massive bag of crisps for a pound, and I was like, yeah, that's my kind of thing, that's going to make me feel better. But there's Walker's crisps, I'd be like, no, no, they're advertised by a football man, he's maybe a chav, I'm not a chav, I don't eat these crisps. But the kettle chips, probably made in the same factory, probably the exact same thing, but the value that they sell is this, oh yeah, you, you can take those to a party as a kid, they're a classy thing. So we start looking at how the supermarkets are utilising our values and the things we care about to move products, because they're not food anymore. Foods have a category called the NOVA food group, so N-O-V-A, you can look them up, it's very interesting. Class one foods are things that like, have grown or come from an animal and they look very much like something you can eat, you can recognise it as edible. 
Class two food is what they call the minimally, you know, the culinary ingredients. Things like sugar, salt, oils. And for a large amount of the human history, we had the things that grew and the things that we cooked them with and spices in it. And that was kind of food. And then in more recent times, we've stepped into what we call minimally processed foods, which is where somebody's taken the flour, you know, the culinary ingredients, and made them into like breads and made them into maybe sandwiches and sold them to people. And now they have a whole new category, which they're calling ultra-processed food, which I don't think should be called that. I think they should be called ultra-processed products because food is hydrating and food is nutritious. And the very definition of an ultra-processed product is an industrial assemblages of post-whole food ingredients. They have absolutely no nutrients in, and not only do they not add nutrients to the body, they actively harm the body. They are toxic for the body. So when we're thinking about children's health and family health, and we've got this, we've got to get your five a day in, it's like, okay, well, what are we eating? You know, what are we actually putting in here and what impact is that going to have on our long-term physical and mental health? I sit here and everyone's like, oh my God, that's a swear, so beat me up later. Yeah, but everyone's like, like, oh my God, what do we do? The thing we do, the first step into this is to start noticing that this kind of isn't okay because there's so much wrapped up around food and well-being that makes us feel guilty, makes us feel ashamed, makes us want to hide how we eat and and you know, as the minute I talk to anyone and say, oh, I work with nutrition, they're like, I don't eat biscuits, I never eat biscuits. And it makes people feel bad. And we've got to get around, you know, around this in our heads that the food industry puts an incredible amount of money into making things that are hyper-palpable so you can't stop eating them. They override your body's natural ability to know when it's full and non-satiating so you physically can't feel full. So we've got to notice, okay, the food industry is doing some really dark stuff, and the question is, what do we want instead? And look, you know, this event is happening, we're caring about local food, and the big thing is about making that local food affordable for people, so that people can access it, which, you know, the wonderful um, community fridge is really having a huge, huge impact on that. Always full of fresh food, it's incredible. My, like my work and, and what I try and do is to connect with people and explain to them this is what happens when you eat something. It's no shoulds. I will never, ever tell someone what they should or should not eat. I teach people about how it impacts the body, how it impacts their health, and if they wanted to add something to their diet, what they could add. Because it's not focusing on what we shouldn't eat. It's focusing on, okay, what can we add in? What can we bring in? What might we want to swap in our diet from that to that? And I teach people how to read food labels. Food labels only came about because there was this kind of situation where the government's like, okay, I'm into them, run the country. And there's these guys called public health specialists who have this wacky idea that all the different policies in government should promote and add to people's well-being. Crazy guys, crazy guys. And then there's this food industry who started making more and more products, mass produced, sold across the country, and public health were like, uh, we think they're making people sick. And the government's like, well, taxes, and what can we do? Free market economics, we can't impact on business. So there's this whole like, thing that happened, and in the end they said, okay, food industry was like, you know what? We'll tell people. We'll write on the back that funny little list of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and put all your grams and your percentage. We'll tell them. Informed choice, there you are, no problem, guys. You're choosing it. Eat well. What do they say of the, oh, no, the chocolate bars? Treat wisely. I mean, that is... That is crazy. It's like on the um, alcohol things, the, the marketing things like drink aware. <laughs> when you drink alcohol, what is the first thing that goes? You know, stop your aware. Treat wisely. Yeah, we're really wise when we're pumped full of sugar and other things that cause chemical reactions in the brain to make us behave not normally, not our usual self. Oh, gosh. So it's all crazy, crazy stuff. And we need to look at, okay, what is it we want to eat? What can we add to? What can we swap to instead? I never stop talking now because I don't know how long I've been talking. ourselves well. Because often when we want to treat ourselves, it's because either we've had a great day and we're like, yeah, 
or we've had a rubbish day and we're like, oh, I need to treat myself. Or we want to celebrate someone else, we want to bring someone else a gift, or we want to do something nice for someone else or ourselves. That is a really, really good thing. And the food industry is a genius. They have connected, on one hand, their sugary, fatty, oily, shiny products, whatever, and treats. They have put those two together and said to treat yourself, you need to buy something that's actually not nutritious and harmful. And that is a good time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a good time right there. You know, and they put it in the nice boxes and the nice packaging and all that kind of stuff. The reason they make the, the product shiny is because when a human sees something shiny, it means water and we need water. They make all those colourful, colourful things because if we see colourful foods, that means it's got nutrients in. The most colourful fruits and vegetables are the most densely packed with nutrient fruit vegetables. So there you walk down the, you know, the snack aisle or whatever it is, you've got the colours and you've got the shininess because it makes our brain go, oh yeah, that's they're good, they're the good things. And then you open it and it's beige and looks really sad inside because if they just showed us that, we're less into it. You know, they have to make the croissant shiny for us to like them. I really, it's not shiny croissant, it's just like a bit of a brown lump, you know, it's less interesting. So the food industry is doing all this stuff and we're like, okay, well I'm going to treat myself with all the shiny, shiny, shiny. And what's really important, and this is something I work with on families a lot, is this understanding of, okay, how do we treat ourselves well? And this isn't saying, I can never treat myself with food. You know, there's no dogma, there's no rules. It's not like, oh, you can't and you can't. It's like, how can we make, uh, you know, how can we make sure that each of us has a variety of ways of treating ourselves well? And there's a family I've worked with recently, and the, the, the mother came on a six-week course with me. She was, I think, five stone over her safe level of body mass index, like an obesity scale. We worked together in January, she's got one more stone to lose now, you know? She learned about the food, she learned about her body, she made some additions and some swaps. She was doing that whole thing, and she's working with her kids, and she's changing the diet, and they're like, what the hell's this for dinner, mum, what's quinoa, you know? So she said, okay, Elle, can you do a workshop with them? And we do one, it's called, why can't I have it, mum? And I taught them, okay, this is what happens in the gut, this is what happens in your brain, this is what the food industry's doing. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we want freedom from that too, because no one wants to be manipulated, no one. The children are really hot on this. And now, they've worked with this idea of treating themselves well, and there's one day, I had this an email about it, it was amazing. They had a really, really difficult day, and the little son came to the mum and said, do you think we should have a takeaway tonight? And she thought about it, and she was like, oh, he wants us all to be together. He wants us all to sit together and be together and share something because today's been hard. And she said, you know what, Let, let's not do that. Let's, let's have the meal we planned, but let's go out and buy a board game of probably even less money than they've spent on the takeaway, and bought them all an actual treat, and then they all went and played that game together and had far more of a shared experience and a deeper connection and a deeper you know, revitalised well-being than any takeaway ever could have done that day and the next day as well. Because what we eat today determines how we feel tomorrow. So it is extremely, extremely possible for people in the community on any kind of income stream to make the kind of changes that allow their body and their mind to feel really, really well. We just need to empower ourselves and leave the food industry and all their control behind. If anyone's super interested, I've got some cards over there on the table that you can come and talk to me about it. But yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Alright, so good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, thank you for having me talk today. Uh, for those who, of you who don't know me, I am the head chef and co-owner at Queen of Cups on North Oak Street. Um, so we're a restaurant and a free house and uh, we set up about a year ago and one of the things that has been really important to me since moving here has been making sure I try and use as much local produce as possible and that's something that is so important to me and I'm here today to tell you why and I really hope that it's something that other restaurants in the area will start to take on board. So there are a million and one reasons why we should be using local food. We see it everywhere in the media. The breakfast TV telling us to get our fingers in the soil. There's influencers on Instagram with their basket from the farmer's market. It's everywhere. But it isn't just hype. It isn't just a fad. There is a reason why we should be doing it. So for those of you who don't know about my restaurant, I am one half of Queen of Cups. This is my business partner slash collaborative assistant for the day. Um, our menu is designed as a sharing concept. We use the best of local produce with Middle Eastern flavours and using classic French techniques. 
If you haven't been down, come and try. Our hummus is great. Um, but part of it has been reaching out to as many local suppliers as I can, and it has been challenging but rewarding. So to a certain extent, using so many different suppliers and using an entirely seasonal menu does make a rot for my own back. It means I'm redesigning the menu every two months. It means that I'm paying a million different bills. But the pros entirely outweigh the cons, in my opinion. It might sometimes be stressful, but the benefits, the main one being for me, is the quality. Now, the quality of the produce in Somerset, as I'm sure many of you know, is phenomenal. I cannot rant and rave about how amazing some of the local farmers and producers are. So as my dad's assistant here has today, we've got some Cheddar Vale strawberries. Now they are grown just down the road, and I can guarantee you, any strawberry you buy at a supermarket in January will never be as good as one of these strawberries in the height of season. I may not have enough to hand out because I didn't know how many people were here today, but please take the strawberry pass apart and tell me how that is not fantastic, how that is not delicious, and how that's not better than something you find in a supermarket completely off season. That is one of the main reasons. And then for me, that translates into my food. So if I am using the best seasonal produce, that means my food is going to immediately taste better and my customers are going to be happier. You can't tell me a strawberry from Peru in February is any better than this. You really can't. And that reflects through every element of every dish. It doesn't matter if it's a pea, if it's a cabbage, really does make all the difference to a meal from start to finish. So at this stage we all know about seasonal fruit and veg. It's, it's spoken about everywhere. We are all learning the importance of it. Not only is it helpful for flavour but nutritionally, like local fruit and veg is going to be better for you. But it also translates to things like fish as well, which a lot of people don't realise. So we see mussels in the supermarket all year round. But they actually have a breeding season. So they say never buy them in the months with an R in it. So I will never put mussels on my menu between May to November, even September and October, because they have a breeding season. So your ones in December are going to be plump and juicy and flavoursome. But if you get a mussel in August, that mussel's been swimming around, trying to breed, flirting with other mussels, not going to be the tastiest, it's going to be small, it's going to be tough, it's going to be chewy. So it really does go to show that every element of your meal, every element of every dish, it matters when you eat it, why you eat it, what you choose to eat. And the next reason I want to highlight is, as I mentioned briefly, the fantastic produce in Somerset. It is astounding. If you look in just a five mile radius, the number of farmers and producers. I lived in London for 10 years and I had no contact with any of my suppliers. It was all just do it through an email, ordering it, and it just comes from big warehouses. You have no real connection to the food. Whereas with some of the producers I use, I use a place called Warminster Farm. They're based five and a half miles away. They pick the vegetables in the morning and bring it to the restaurant. It cannot get fresher, it cannot get more local. And my God, the beetroots are unlike any beetroots I've had. And our other um, company that we really like, and I promise I'm not sponsored by any of them, I just really love them all, is that um, I've tried a lot of yogurts over the years. And one of the staples of Middle Eastern cuisine is a product called Labna. So Labna is a strained yogurt, it's salted and strained, and it's thick, a bit like cream cheese. And it's had for breakfast, lunch, dinner, you name it. And I have that on my menu, and I've gone through a multitude of yogurts from big suppliers, and I've recently settled on Brown Cow Organics in Hilton. So again, super local. But the thing that impressed me the most about it is the flavour. It doesn't just taste like yogurt. You can taste the hay, you can taste the grass. It's like when wine experts talk about terroir and how you can taste the soil in the wine. It's just like that for me. It's just like that with this yogurt. You can taste where the cows were grazing. You can taste that they grew up slowly. They had a happy life. They looked after. And for me, that was it. I knew I had to have this product. Yes, it might be slightly more expensive, but marginally so. Only marginally. And for the fact that it is a local farmer, a local company, 
Uh, there's no question about it for me. The taste is phenomenal and the providence is important. The other aspect that I think is incredibly important in all of this is supporting the local economy. Now, it's been a rough couple of years for everyone, but very rough for farmers and for producers. So by buying local produce, we support the local economy, we make more local jobs. These are things that are really important in these really tough times when people are so divided. So if we can come together as a community through food, through the production of food, that's absolutely fantastic. If you can tell someone their food came from this farm that has a farm shop, they might go there on that day, on their day off, and go and buy a, a pot of yogurt or a punnet of strawberries. But that helps your local community, and that to me, I think, is also incredibly important. Also, by going with local suppliers and local farmers, you are avoiding large-scale industrial practices. Um, local small-scale agricultural practices, eating seasonally, is, you can't argue it is better for the environment. Now I know we can't change the world in just Glastonbury alone, but as much as we might protest and argue we can, it's a small place to start. It really is, and if we can all just be doing a little bit more local shopping, putting that into our plates, onto our restaurants, onto our menus, that it's going to benefit all of us in the long run. Now, I'm no expert on the economic elements of the supply chain. There are people much more qualified to talk about it than me. But I can assure you that if, any, if each and every one of us just put a little bit more into our local suppliers and local producers, the benefits would be reaped by every single one of us. We'd be healthier, we'd be happier, we'd have a flourishing community. My next part is, it's, again, I'm not trying to start a revolution, um, but I do think that if each and every person in this room just grew some tomatoes on their windowsill, like I, I do not have green fingers, to say the least, I will kill any plant I touch, but I'm enthusiastic and I will try, but having some homegrown tomatoes, your own basil that you've grown, there is that sense of satisfaction, that sense of pleasure that really is a tangible, wonderful feeling. So if every single person in this room just grew a thyme plant, which apparently is hardier, I'm not convinced I've killed quite a few, um, it would really make just that little bit of a difference to challenging the status quo. But it just means that um, everything has a story. So to round it off, essentially every ingredient I use in my restaurant, I try to source as locally as possible. I cannot always do that. There are no sesame fields to make tahini in Somerset. If someone wants to set up a tahini field, I will absolutely happily buy local tahini. Um, but for me, food has a story. Every ingredient has a story. It starts somewhere. It's not just the supplier coming in in the morning and giving me a tray of food to then make a meal out of. This is the farmer who's planted these seeds to grow this veg to then bring to my restaurant and treat with respect. It's the cows that the farmer looks after to produce the yogurt. Every item in this restaurant that I love so dearly has a meaning to me, it has a story. And I really want to tell that story through my food. And I really think that's why it's so important to be using local producers and trying to be as sustainable and local as possible. And uh, thank you, that's my TED talk for the day. <laughs>
courgettes. Get your courgettes in at the moment. They are phenomenal. You have the flowers as well, which you can stuff with. If you're buying local cheese, you can stuff them with ricotta. Another thing is there are some phenomenal honey growers in the area. So I think that is another staple. Because if you are, I love just the lemon and honey tea, but doing it with local honey, you'll get the local flora and pollen as well. So I can of trust like, the, the greatness of local honey. And then one is just even going to Stephen's Butchers. There, you know, I get my meat from them. The cows from the other side of the tour. Those are my, probably my three staples. The courgettes at the moment, the phenomenal meat from Stephen's, and the honey. And I, I mean, if you're really going for it, try and build your own flour. It's possible to do at home with a good blender, and you can make your own sourdough if you have a lot of time. <laughs> Um, so berries are in season, we're coming into season now, um, so they're one of the like, most nutritious things you can put into your body, they taste really good, you can make smoothies, you can just have a snack on them, and yet you can get them um, locally in quite a lot of the shops on the high street, I think, so yeah, enjoy the berries. Um, nothing to add in terms of uh, suggestions for seasonal food, but just to say that lots of people who have allotments locally, um, and to overproduce something or put things in the a community pantry, uh, sorry, sorry, in the community fridge, which is just the front of the town hall. Um, so, if any time you see anything in there that you would like to use, then please do pop in and um, grab anything that you would like. Not seasonal thing, but one of the things I found is actually about eggs. We about some years ago decided as a family that eggs were grey and awful when we were from the supermarket. So we started keeping chickens and we have a couple of chickens. The, the yellow of the egg feels like it's been dyed yellow. Right? I know that our chickens do not have antibiotics stuck into them. Yeah? Um, you do also get to put it on your guinea eggs for three weeks and then give you all the eggs that you have given you in the last three weeks all in one go and you've got to eat. But from the point of view of eating with as well, they're not processed. The other one I can say of, from my own experience is eggs. You can see the difference, you can taste the difference in the food. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else got a question for our speakers? No problem, I think. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. That's really exciting. Um, so, as we've got uh, weather getting warmer and hotter and possibly drier in the summer and maybe wetter in the winter, um, what do you think, and it's growing, but what do you think we can start growing locally that will be of, of, of mass benefit, taking into consideration, I don't know, maybe um, wetter as well on the levels, but yeah different kind of foods that we could play with locally. Rather than what can we grow as a huge thing, and something that we've found from the allotment project is people don't have the skill or confidence to grow literal things at home. And that I think, because I listened to the speakers this morning and they talked in great and good things and they felt like a mountain. And I felt like little mouse at the bottom of a mountain going, I can't, I can't deal with that, I can't, I can't impact on that. But if we as a community and as individuals grew a tomato plant, grew a potato, and we all had a little bit that we grew on our windowsill or wherever it was we had, I think that would be the, the big, a big impact that we as a community and as individuals could do, and something we could achieve. I think we have to set this as a mountaineering phrase, which is you climb a mountain by one step. Because you look at the whole mountain, you'll never get there. You do one step at a time. I think the first step for us as a community is the little thing that I I mean, I couldn't agree more. As I mentioned, I feel any plant I look at. Um, but if I can keep a basil plant alive, then anyone can. Because that's just even making your own homemade pestos, homemade sauces, just a little thing you can start with. And I mean, if you go to any local garden centre, they have all the, the plants ready to go that are perfect for this season. I mean, we're starting to, it's getting a little late in the season to grow beans at the moment, but I think now is a great time to forage. Be careful with foraging, read your books, take notes. Uh, I wouldn't recommend foraging mushrooms unless you're experienced in it. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the moment, they're not their best has been quite dry, but berries, as you mentioned, berries are in abundance at the moment. So just go hedgerow foraging. 
and you can do amazing things like you can get blackberries and ferment them into sauces for winter. You can do so much with all of the hedgerow produce at the moment. And again, just a tomato plant on your windowsill. If I can do it, I'm pretty sure anyone can, honestly. Yes, well, I totally salute growing myself. Um, I, I grow as well, um, locally. And it's been a really different year this year. I don't know if anyone grows, but the, yeah, I had my most unsuccessful year of vegetables growing at home, which is a little bit disappointing. And I guess for me, what I'm seeing is that it's almost like there's been a season change. Like every, things that would have stopped growing maybe end of September now go through onto even November because of how it's changed. So I think now, myself, I'm changing the way I perceive the seasons and when, when I plant things and how long things grow for. And I'm also a huge advocate of an organisation called Hogmadots and they are growing an incredible amount of things that we associate with being imported here in the UK and they're getting more and more success. And they're also starting to grow different types of beans and grains that you might not have heard of before um, that are very nutritious and very available to eat. So it would be really wonderful to see if those kind of things could be grown um, around Somerset. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, growing things in the changing climate and, and um, the kind of the soil and the, the things that we can do here, I can't claim to be an expert at all. But what I was really surprised that we are able to grow quite easily and very successfully uh, with my very limited knowledge and with my children at home is cucumbers. We were getting cucumbers that are about that long. They're longer than the, the cucumbers in the shops and, and they're just absolutely delicious. Um, they were pretty surprised and they're still growing. I haven't done anything to them since last year. And I looked the other day and put cucumbers in it. <laughs> cucumbers! <laughs> I'd add one more thing just for anyone who is um, interested in buying seed or maybe hasn't bought seed before. There's an organization called the Real Seed Co. And in, in Europe, there are, there's like a list of seeds that you're legally allowed to sell. And that doesn't include all the heritage and the ancient seeds of the land. So the Real Seed Co. is set up as a sort of a cooperative. And when you buy something from them, one penny of your order goes to becoming a member of their organization because they can't sell heritage seed to a member of the public, but they can sell it to their own members. So they sort of get around it in a really clever loophole. And because it's heritage seed, it has a relationship with the different environments around the UK. So they'll, and they'll say, you know, what grows well in Wales, what grows well even in Scotland. So they're a really great resource for anyone looking to grow and to be in climate sensitive as well. Great, thank you. Um, I just bought some peas from, from the Real Seed Company called the Champion of England, which are amazing. They grow this tall, because they're all like relatively small, and the most sweet, beautiful peas I've ever had in my life. I, I, yeah, I really recommend them. Anyway, um, any other questions? Yes, sorry. Thank you. Well, now as you we used to run around and see both uh, local Britain's food as a as both of the North East. But I was thought I was one black person in the class. Because uh, everybody was into the screen, like what they are nowadays. So like and another thing is I think what we should promote is nutritional science in schools, show people what food really is, like what they had mentioned, how good it is, how you Equalize in your body and all that. And another thing is, when I first came to class, we had a very good green grocers, which we haven't got yet anymore. And then green grocers are good, and so, like you say, it's all the produce of people in the end, and all go and buy from the green grocers. So the supermarket. I know I used to shop in the supermarket. Never used to shop. You go up there, or what was called green things, and they had the green grocers. Another thing, I just want to mention this thing when I found on the net, the People's Health Alliance. It's a key be helpful for the audience. It's an organic uh, people's late grassroots organization to, to great help the world and the people that support and pub up people in the UK. And what they're trying to do, which I find interesting economically, is asking for one pound of a million people. So to provide knowledge, understanding, good food supplies and, and more integrated health things holistic and all that thing. So that's about all I'm going to say. So good help to everyone. Don't eat crap food. Be kind to yourself and be kind to others. And let's have a peaceful world. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Um, just to mention, you mentioned green grocers. So you can get fresh green veg in the market on Tuesday, um, which is really um, good. Yeah. 
So, um, forgive me if someone's already answered this question, but um, so the town council is very supportive of this whole event and in supportive of trying to encourage more resilience around local sustainable food. Um, if it was possible to wave a magic wand so that the council did something, could put their energy or even money behind something, what would you have the council do to help achieve the sustainable local food? Is there anything that, that you think the council could do to help the people of the town and people of the area achieve that? <laughs> So kind of tying into what um, Malcolm mentioned as well, like in um, education, the, especially in primary education, there's things on the curriculum about nutrition and about food. However, primary teachers, they have to become a specialist in so many different areas to deliver the whole curriculum. What they often end up is doing their very best bit of internet research, and if anyone's ever researched nutrition, I well, don't use that as a title, a nutritionist, you can train in 200 different modalities and have an entirely different way of relating and speaking about food. So I think a nutrition education that's firmly grounded in like a public health approach, focusing on prevention and understanding how, what food does in the body rather than just what should and shouldn't, and this is what a plate looks like. For children to get what we call critical nutrition literacy, where they have the ability to read food labels and look at food packaging and make a more informed and critical um, choice about what's happening rather than just being brainwashed by the packaging, I think would be really, really useful. And that can be done quite simply with training for primary school teachers and then you know, they can feed it into the school because it's once you know about it, you can learn about it in an afternoon. It's not that it's incredibly complex, it's just that if you don't know, how, how can you know? Yeah. And because the model of critical nutrition literacy doesn't necessarily, you know, the food industry doesn't love it, you know, they're not making mad profit from it. And there's a lot of primary school initiatives around like breakfast mornings and things that all come from Kellogg's and those other kind of organisations. And you can get Cocoa Pops and just all the stuff that you wouldn't generally think of, okay, this is going to set the child up well for the school day, provide it for free because then the children will eat it and that's all they care about. They're actually just trying to get the consumer really young. So yeah, critical nutrition literacy, I think, is something that could be offered in schools, but also to anyone that provides food in the town, because the more we're informed and can step away from this, or the heaviness of always oh, allowing to put the information, I think that could make a, a huge profound change. Well, I'm just coming from uh, the area of the hospitality industry. Um, so for my restaurant, I could be making so much more money if I was buying cheap, crap produce. Um, if I were boiled in a bag of food, I could make infinitely more money, but as a moral point, I will not do that. But it's a problem in the entire hospitality industry, and it reflects in supermarkets. It is much easier, or it's much cheaper, to buy bad food. So that is something that needs to be tackled, that needs to be grants, that needs to be, I'm no expert by any means whatsoever, I can only tell you from my experience, but I do think that restaurants that are trying to be sustainable and trying to be supportive of local communities should be entitled to advertising or grants of some form. They've introduced something now, the Michelin Guide, which is the Green Star, which is separate from the one, two, three stars, and it's just for sustainability. So if councils can reward members of the hospitality community for putting things in place that help the local community, that help uh, farmers and suppliers, I think that would be important in my part of the world, in my experience anyway. I'm going to try and say this without being rude about education. Um, I've been working around education for about 30 years, and I have seen a change in education over that period. And the change has been from do it to describe it. So, where in the past you took someone, a young person, and you said, make me a cake, what we now are getting a lot of is describe how someone else would make a cake. And I can give you an example of this. We run a programme aimed at 16 and 17 year olds who are moving into independent living. So they are going to give them the skills to live in a small flat by themselves. And part of that programme is about cooking. Because if you're going to live by yourself, you've got to cook your dinner, right? 
Um, when we first started running the program, I thought I would start running the cooking classes at Spaghetti Bolognese. That to me was an entry level piece of cooking. We now run them at Boil and Egg. The skill level in our 16 to 18 year olds around cooking food is almost non-existent. Unless their parents are into cooking from raw materials, they don't have it at all. So one of the things that we find we get is young people spending a lot more money than they should do on food because the only food they understand is what goes in the microwave or they dial on the phone and it gets delivered. They have no knowledge of what to do with a potato. Right? I've had young people who can't use a tin opener to open a tin at 17. Because they've been, and these are the people who have been excluded from education, they've gone through the education system and they've reached the age of 17 not being able to open a tin. So if you're asking what can we do, it's about education. But knowledge is power. If we teach people, and one of the things, if I say I've been doing this for 30 years, right, and it's got worse in the last 15 or 20, I have to say. Right, so those 16 year olds from 20 years ago are 35 now. They're the parents of the children that I am now working with. So they don't have the skill as a parent to pass it on to their children because they never got taught it. So it's, it's working with everybody here to teach people that basic, fundamental. This is how we grow a potato, this is how you process a potato until you can eat it. Right. It sounds really sad, but I think that's where we're at. We have a lot of people who don't know that basic how to open the tin and do something. And if we keep talking about big things, it's wonderful, but reality is we can't teach them how to open the tin. You know, I, I, we've been saving stuff from our allotments and sticking it in the, in the um, fridge here. Yeah, but you look at the stuff there, and then certain individuals take some of the stuff out because they don't know how to use it. We need to give them that knowledge. Yeah. Randy, do you want to add to that? I was just going to say something very similar to you, and I thought that I thought that that might be something similar. I thought you'd probably say it better. But just as a mother of two children myself, um, I think nutritional education at school is absolutely essential for getting that message through to children, but so is having the experience of this is how food is grown, this is how you get your fingers dirty, this is, you know, planting a seed and watching it grow, having opportunities for connecting the food that you might be buying from supermarkets realistically, connecting that with where it's come from and the processes that it's been going through, and it links into things being available seasonally and locally, um, but I think starting with children, and actually children quite often teach their parents about the things that they're learning in school. So starting with children, giving them the skills at an early age that they can grow up with, that will see them through you know, the rest of their lives, and they can be the ones educating in the future. Thank you, that's such a great question, John. And um, since I moved back here in September 2019, I've echoed the thing that there's no green process. I was so shocked. I had to a friend who said, Oh, you've been to Bastonbury. Is there a green grocer? Because that's a sign that the community is doing all right when there's a green grocer. And I'm determined we will have a green grocer. I'm getting old. I don't want to run it by myself. I've worked. Too long, for too long. I'm really prepared to put some of my savings into. So if anybody else wants to do it, the town council could help set up a shop for local produce that and it could be an information exchange as well. That would be the thing. And the other thing I just want to say is I realised I'm looking around at flat with the roulette and there's a cook in there. And I thought actually people have forgotten how to turn on the cooker. Cookers sit in flats, they don't get used. It's just microwaves. Don't know how you can turn that around. That's not the town council. Um, just about the green grocer, I had that conversation with Paddington Farm at our last open day, and they used to have a green grocer in the town, he said. 
and they couldn't make it work because there wasn't enough custom. That was the um, Yes, and it was. Yeah, yeah. And so now they sell their produce in the market on Tuesdays. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's different things. So you can get fresh fruit and veg at the market, but you're right, it would be nice to have something every day that it needs. I'd like to add to that the issue also is the ease and the convenience in which it is to get the healthy food. So for me, it's if I order a pizza online, it will be within half an hour. To go to Tesco and to buy a veg and come back and cook a meal takes three times as long. But we need to educate people that that time, extra time spent is worth it. There is satisfaction from doing it yourself. So as we were saying, children are learning how to cook. If we can get people to cook, get some real satisfaction from making a dish from start to finish. Because I do think there is an intrinsic joy in making a plate of food, labouring over it, and then enjoying it. So if we can educate people in that and share that, then hopefully we can take people further away from the idea of fast food, easy food. Because that, at the end of the day, convenience and speed is what so many people end up leaning towards. So it's just the whole overhaul of the idea of the joy of cooking itself. Do you want to ask a question? Why did you mean? Because when we do follow up on the cooking food, we've got to teach you not to waste it as well. So much food gets thrown away every year. This is something that we brought up the council actually is that as a restaurant we have to pay extra to have our food waste taken away. They charge us more to recycle and be conscientious, and that in itself is wrong. And we're very lucky we have very low waste, like we use all our old lemon peels, if we have like off cuts of leaves, they go to one of the um, chef's ducks. But the council should make it easier. And we should benefit from trying to recycle. We shouldn't have to pay and suffer to be better people and to be better for the environment. But you should pay someone to do so. Hmm? Well, as well. Are there any more questions for our panel? Well, thank you. That's been a really um, great discussion. And I think we're actually ending up, because I've got rid of the brain, we're, we're um, ending up. Um, yeah. So, okay. do you want to have a question? Oh, just uh, something came up. I don't know if I can put it. I just read a book called English Pastoral about a, uh, a farmer who grew up on a farm. Quite interesting historical look at English farming. Anyway, he commented on how much people spend on their, in their weekly shop on food, uh, about their weight out of their money, what they've got, what they spend on food. It used to be about 40% back in the 60s and 70s, and now it's 11%. So they're spending all the other money on other things. I think from what I've heard it's gone back up to 40% recently, but that's it. Yeah, I guess it's a, a thing I touch on. Um, a lot of people have worked with, um, so in the last six months I've worked with nearly 200 different people through Somerset Skills and Learning who are a local adult college who provide free courses and workshops to anyone in Somerset. So if you don't know about it, look it up. Somerset Skills and Learning, incredible organisation. And a lot of people I've worked with through that, they were concerned about whether or not it would cost more to eat in a more nourishing way. And some of the women I've worked with over a period of about 10 weeks, by the end of that, one of them was sharing, she said, I was told a friend and meeting with someone else, and she said, but how are you affording it? And then she realised that she's been saving money, because it's actually when we enter the supermarket and we look at, say we're shopping in the supermarket, 
and we see the fruit and the veg, and so you see a planet of berries and another two pounds. Is it two pounds of planet of berries? Blah, blah, blah. But then by the time you walk around all the different aisles and see all the different prices, and you get to the chocolate bars, and it's only two pounds for a big bar or something, then that same two pounds can get spent on something far less nutritious, and often that will be eaten quicker than the fresh produce. So there's a real like shift in how we spend our money and how we relate to eating healthfully. So, and I'm not talking about people buying organic food, absolutely, I'm not saying it's not part of the problem as well. But if we compare the different foods that we talked about earlier, buying fresh food that's not organic, if we're buying ultra processed foods and the things in packets, they're definitely not organic. They're definitely not made in an organic way. So it's like, for me, it's like looking at the big picture, looking at what people can afford, and if it is non organic fruit and veg, and that's still a really positive thing for their, for their body and their health, and can still be done on a budget. A little observation on the young ultra processed food business. Um, I'm very concerned that so many things are labelled vegan, ultra processed, hideous things. Um, somebody else supplied me with some sausages which I cooked and they managed to bat them out and offended me beyond belief. We've just got to get back to eating food. And I've heard the term in the matrix, as in, in its original format, you chew it, you've never forgotten how to chew. And how bad is that? You know, my other issue with sort of kids is they don't have the palate for weird food. You know, if you put something in front of kids, it's weird. They've got to learn that very little. You know, when they're being weaned, they've got to learn that. Otherwise, they won't suddenly come to their common life. As a child, we only ever ate baked beans and sausages. For until I was in my twenties, I think, literally hardly any food. I now eat whole food, whole food, plant-based, and it's been lovely flavoured. Yeah. But when did you do that? Did you do that at ten, twelve? Well, I'm kids actually. Well, kids make it. So it doesn't take a long time. But you can turn around. Sorry. Yeah, I can touch on um, the whole food thing because it's really really interesting we look at the last 15 years the rise of the amount of vegan products in the market and even like I can't remember what brand of well-known sausage producer they now make a vegan alternative Richmond yeah exactly and that if anything has, has one demonstrated that consumers hold all the power because the things that we want to buy they will make whatever it is because we don't actually care what they sell a lot of the big producers they just want to sell stuff they don't care what they, as long as we buy and the, you know, the word vegan has become a really interesting thing because it used to be that if a person practiced a vegan, vegan is not like a vegan is a lifestyle. And if you practice a vegan lifestyle, you kind of, you had a very big list of things you couldn't eat and you had to cook for yourself. That was like the majority yeah. of the past 100 years or so, whatever. When did veganism begin? I'm sure you know. About 100 years ago, I'll take it. Yeah, exactly. It's not my word. We're going to another time. And it's this idea that, um, so veganism is a lifestyle that's become much more common now, much more prevalent, and it has nothing to do with how well a person treats the body. So a person could be vegan and live on bourbon biscuits and chips from the chip shop and God knows what else. So when I see foods labeled vegan, I also find it really strange because it's like, well, and it also kind of can't be because if you're using herbicides and pesticides, then that's not vegan. That can't be vegan as the as the basis of what a vegan diet is. And I think labeling that would be more useful is to understand what is in the food, so what is nutritious. So there was a, a nutritious score on the front of a food packet, and if it's got a zero on it, you kind of get an idea there that there's not a lot in it. So yeah. So I mean, it's an appalling, it's an appalling way that we are now being conned. Vegan equals healthy. Yeah. And it's just and actually it doesn't. If it's ultra processed food, it's still absolutely rubbish. Yeah, if anyone wants a very interesting little critical look at they have in a supermarket, there's a, a brand that has come out called Love Grow, it's called R-A-W. So they're marketing at that moment, healthy, the raw food, this whole thing. They do like a, what they're trying to imply is a healthy version of a Kinder Bueno. It's got 13 different types of sugar in it. 13 different types and on the front we said, love raw, love your body, vegan alternatives. So we really support the critical nutrition literacy. This is why it's so important for us to be able to have that skill of being able to see past it. Because it's not, it's not our fault that we don't want to spend ages having to decode everything. So if we have some skills, then it becomes easy. Yeah. It's interesting looking at the 
wonder how we can change our minds about how we live and how we work to make ourselves able to have that time to think about comparing stuff. It's a really interesting thing that's just occurred to me, especially listening to the last conversations here. Thank goodness we're talking about it. Because if we weren't talking about it, we really would be in trouble. So, what a wonderful day. It's great. I'm so pleased that Glastonbury Town Council has been able to support today and to support the Somerset Food Trail and the festival that will go on throughout this period of time. And I think that it's something that anyone who lives in another parish other than Glastonbury, who has a council other than Glastonbury, who have people who eat, maybe you could do something similar in your town. You could have a little event going on on a Sunday where you get all the local producers and all the great people who are around to come and talk about what they do. If you're tied into Somerset Food Trail, that would be great. But if you're not in Somerset, there's always the opportunity to have the Dorset Food Trail, or the Wiltshire Food Trail, or dare I say it, even the Gloucester Food Trail. We could be, I'm sure they do, but we could be just getting this out. And then so, if you're a parish councillor and you're watching this, you're going, well, that's inspirational. You can do it too. So let's just get that whole thing moving, get the dialogue going. Sustainable local food is going to be part of the answer to all the problems that are coming down the line, and they really are coming. So let's uh, give a big round of applause for ourselves and all the speakers today. Thank you for coming.